Hey guys, and welcome to another episode of Jesus Doctrine. Today, I want to take the chance to talk to you a little bit about Jesus' death, his burial, and his resurrection. And so that's what we're going to be looking at today. Now, I'm going to try and stay away from the typical Sunday morning church, but death, burial, and resurrection messages, because I know that we're all going to hear some brilliant messages about those things in the next couple of minutes. Good evening, Charlie. It's good to see you here in the live chat. And so I just wanted to take the chance to talk a little bit about Jesus' death, his burial, and his resurrection. I can see that Rick is also here in the live chat as well. So I thought to kick us off, where to start, but what does the Bible say? Paul the Apostle says this, by which you also are saved if you hold fast to that word which I preach to you, unless you believe in vain. And then he goes on to say, for I delivered first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried and that he rose again on the third day, according to the scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas, also known as Peter, and then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some of them have fallen asleep, speaking about how some of them have died. After that, he was also seen by James, and then by the apostles, and last of all, he was seen by me, so Paul, as one who was born out of due time. So that's the first point that I want to kind of make about this topic. The Bible is very clear that unless we believe in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus, then any sort of Christian faith is completely empty and in vain. This is the foundational truth of the Passover or the Easter message that Christians celebrate. Now, I really want to divulge a little bit away from those fundamentals because I'm hoping that Sunday and every day that you read your Bible in the build up to the Easter or the Passover, if you prefer that language, celebration, I expect that many of you will be familiar or be reading about it. And I want to really begin to look at some of the things that we don't necessarily look at when it comes to Easter. And so here we go. In the, book, in the Bible, the reason for Jesus' death, his burial, and the resurrection is this. It's this curse that happens to Adam and Eve as a result of eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the Bible says this. Then Adam, he said, because you have heeded to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree which I commanded you, saying, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. Until you eat of it, and all the days of your life, both thorns and thistles, it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat of the herb of the field in the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground out of whom you were taken. For dust, for dust you are, and dust you shall return. Now, the reason I start here is because it's the foundation. The Bible says that when God made mankind, he made us out of the same thing that everything else in the world is made from, from the dirt of the ground, from the dust of the earth. And that is what humankind is made out of. And the Bible says that when we were disobedient, God chose to say that the curse is that we should return to dust in the same way that we were made from dust. You're probably familiar with the language that's often said at the end of a funeral. From ashes to ashes, dust to dust. And it's speaking about how God made us from ashes, and so we shall return to ashes. We were made from dust, so we shall return to dust. This is the kind of language that's being used. You see, when Adam and Eve made their mistake, and when they started to live a sinful life and disobey God, one of the consequences was that mankind, as a result of it, would die and ultimately return back to dust. That everything about the flesh and everything about the substance that makes us up became broken and fallen and would fall apart and would lead towards sin. Even the earth that was made, even the whole planet, the thorns and the thistles, even the plants and the harvest and the crops would start to yield weeds and thorns and thistles and these difficult things and would be hard and require our sweat and toil. 
But the good news is that Jesus came with a beautiful gospel. And if you don't know the gospel, I've got a video that I've recently made highlighting the gospel beautifully. I recommend that you watch it. But in short, the gospel is that God came down from heaven and paid the ultimate price for mankind's mistakes. He paid the price for our broken relationship with God. He paid the price for our broken relationships with our family. And ultimately, he paid the price to restore the broken relationship that we have, which is destroying the world. All of this was accomplished through Jesus' birth, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And it's a beautiful message of hope restoration, rejuvenation, a second chance. This is the gospel message. But I said I want to keep this away from the typical Easter theme. And so we now know and understand the curse. So let's have a read of the next passage. And it's none other than Matthew 27. Now, this is one of those interesting passages about Jesus's death, burial and resurrection that we oftentimes glaze over. And it says, then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from the top to the bottom and the earth quaked and the rocks were split and the graves were opened and many of the bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. And then it goes on to say, then, so, that, so when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus, saw the earthquake and the things that happened, they greatly feared. Truly, this was the Son of God. Now, I love that passage because it's so unusual. We oftentimes don't look at passages like that, that speak about how the earth was rent and the rocks were broken and the dead were seen walking the earth. It's a very unusual thing for us to be reading about. Let's go back to that again. Help if we went back to the right verse. Sorry, guys. And many of the body of the saints who had fallen asleep, speaking about those believers who had died, were raised and came out of their graves after his resurrection. They went into the holy city and appeared to many. Now, I'm a Christian and I've been a Christian for a couple of years now, to say the least. But I don't hear many people preaching or teaching about this very obscure and strange verse of the Bible. And so my question is, guys in the live chat, what do you make of this? Before I start giving my own two pennies about what I think, what do you think about such a passage? When Jesus died and he was buried in the tomb, Do you believe that he opened the tombs of dead believers so that they would walk around the city of Jerusalem? Or is this some spiritual application? Is this some prophetic language speaking of what would happen later on at the resurrection of all believers as an afterthought? Or was it saying that this happened literally at the time of Jesus? Now, what's interesting is if we go to the historians that wrote not long after the days of Jesus, like Josephus, You will literally read stories about people testifying about dead people walking around and being seen in Jerusalem after the death of Christ. Now, that's quite interesting. Now, Rick says both. So he believes that they were literally dead people walking around Jerusalem after Jesus's death. But also, he also believes that the dead will be raised again to life at the resurrection or at the rapture or at the twinkling of an eye, at the changing. It's really interesting, this passage, because what does it mean and how does it apply now? Does it mean that every believer in the Old Testament in Jesus suddenly died and came back to life at the point when Jesus died? Hmm. Or is that still to come in the future? All of these questions are worth us asking aloud sometimes. Even when we don't know the answers, the verse doesn't give us a lot. But I do want to point out that the rocks breaking and the graves opening and the dead being raised back to life are a really powerful and central theme in Christian prophecy that is very important through the Old Testament. And it will be significantly important in the new. One thing that we know is that when Jesus died, that death couldn't hold him. The grave couldn't hold him and the tomb couldn't hold him. 
And not only could it not hold him, but when he died, the grave was not able to hold Jesus. But Jesus broke out free in such a way because of the resurrection power that the grave that held on to so many dead people, that people at the time knew that even their graves couldn't hold them anymore. Jesus's victory was so great that it was able to liberate the dead even then in such a dramatic and a powerful way. That's what Franklin's just what he's written. I think it highlights that Jesus just had to resurrect and to liberate the dead. Oh, fierce echo, greetings to you. I can see you in the live chat. And so we find this interesting and powerful dynamic at play. And so should we keep having a look at what else the Bible says regarding this? If we keep going to the next chapter and we just read a couple of verses further, let's see if it gives us any further clues as to what's going on. And the Bible then begins to say. Let's go to chapter eight, sorry, chapter 28. Now, after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to draw near, Mary Madeline and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake. Isn't that interesting? That we're reading in 20, chapter 27, we read about a great earthquake. Now we've come into chapter 28, and again we're reading about a great earthquake. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it, and his countenance was as lightning, and his clothing as white as snow. <coughs> So, and the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. Oh, I love what's going on here. This stuff like this gets me excited. Isn't that something? Jesus has raised, his tomb is opened, an angel comes down and sits on the stone of the tomb. And now the dead man is alive and the living men are filled with such awe, wonder and fear that now they're fearful and they're lying down like dead men. <coughs> the power of the resurrection turned everything upside down. It made the living like the dead, but it makes the dead like the living. This is what's going on here. And it's an awesome picture. Again, we see this earthquake and this dramatic scene going on, this climactic, apocalyptic image in the Old Testament. <coughs> Let's keep reading. But the angel answered and said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. As he said, come and see the place where the Lord laid. And quickly go and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And indeed, he is going before you into Galilee, and you will see him. Behold, I have told you. Now, come back to me a second. Now, why I love this so much is because the awesome power of Jesus is at work. The truth be told, I couldn't tell you with all the earthquakes going on around the time of Jesus's burial, at the time of Jesus in the tomb when the angel appears, all the earthquakes and all the mighty signs going on. I couldn't tell you about the dead walking the earth, about whether they li were literally raised and they lived forevermore, or whether these were recent people that died, like Lazarus. Do you remember what happened to Lazarus in the Bible? The Bible says that he was a dead man. He lay there dead for a couple of days until Jesus arrived. And Jesus spoke the word, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus was raised back to life. We have no account of Lazarus having eternal life. Lazarus probably lived a normal life and died at a ripe old age. Perhaps the dead that were raised to life when Jesus died were those people that had died an untimely death that were allowed to fulfill their days on the earth. There were going to be those people that would say, these were the first fruits that also resurrected with Jesus. But again, I don't have enough to make an answer to why is that verse speaking about. But it definitely gives us a shadow of the profound power 
of what is going on in the resurrection of Jesus. And it shows us that the resurrection of Jesus and the death of Jesus didn't just have enough power to save the life of the Son of God, but to save the life of anyone that would dare to believe. And dare I say, even those that do not believe, it had the power to make them like dead men and to stand in awe and wonder of Jesus. There's nobody denying them when they see a resurrected person. You see, people can deny the idea that Jesus died and resurrected. But I tell you this, when you see a dead person raised to life again, it's hard to, to say, oh, that's just crazy talk. You've seen it. When you see something, it becomes undeniable truth. It becomes something that will strike a fear. It will something that will make you realize that you are insignificant in comparison to the great power and the wonder of God. And so this is what we read about in the scriptures. Now, what's interesting is just by looking in a little bit into the death, the resurrection of Jesus, we're already beginning to see clues of just how powerful the resurrection of Jesus truly is. Should we keep digging a little? And so let's have a read of Ephesians. And it says, but to each one of us was grace given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. I'm going to read that again. But to each one of us was given a grace according to the measure of Christ's gifts. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now, I like this verse, but I want to tell you about the way that I hear it used a lot that I don't necessarily think it is being, it is the right way to use it. I've heard many believers tell me what Jesus did was that he went into the grave and he took those that were being held in Hades or the underworld or the holding place or shield and he takes them and he takes them and he takes those that were captive by death and he sets them free. I don't think that's the case at all because there seem to be two different things going on here. He takes captivity captive and he gives gifts unto men. Let me tell you the gifts that Jesus' ascension gives to believers. It gives us the gift of the Spirit. When I read about Jesus ascending, when I read about Jesus resurrecting, he gives us the gift of eternal life. He gives us his own life. He, when he ascends on high and sits on the throne of God on the day of Pentecost, the Bible says that he sends his life-giving Spirit, the Holy Spirit. He gives a hymn to us to dwell and to rest in a believer. And he gives the gifts of the spirit to each one of us as the measure of our faith. These are the gifts that are given to men. So what does it mean when it speaks about he takes captive captivity? Well, for me, it's speaking about what Jesus did to the powers of darkness that come to attack and to lie and to deceive us. And to tell us that there is no God and that God cannot help us and that death is the end of life. The Bible says that Jesus takes captivity. Captive. That means that he's going to take the very evil spirits and the demonic thoughts and the demonic strategies that were trying to destroy Jesus even before he was born. And he imprisons them and locks them up so they cannot do the harm that they were trying to do before. Let's think about this for a minute. When Jesus was born in this world, the world so came against Jesus. The evils of the enemy so came against Jesus that they were willing to kill every man, man child that was born, every male child. The, the devil tries to kill. They sent them to the river and they tried to kill them. They take the Romans and they try to kill them. Jesus had to flee into Egypt because they were killing all the male borns children of Israel, in the same way that Moses had to be put into a river because all of the male children of Israel were being destroyed by the works of darkness. But when Jesus Christ died and resurrected, all of a sudden the powers of darkness that were trying to stop Jesus' birth, 
that were trying to stop Jesus' death and resurrection. They were trying to stop the good news that would bring a second chance, that would bring renewal, that would bring a regeneration of life in this world. All of those forces of darkness had completely failed. And now Jesus takes them captive and imprisons them till the end of time. No longer does the sting of these enemies have any sting anymore. Jesus has taken the enemy. He's defanged him and he's made him captive to the power of the resurrection of Christ. I believe that Jesus' death changed and brought down some of the spiritual strongholds that fought against the salvation of many of us as believers today. I believe that Jesus did something to the enemy. And I want to show you why I believe that. And I want to show you a few verses. Like I said, this isn't the typical Sunday morning Easter message. I want to have a look a little bit about Jesus this Easter and a bit about what he did in a very specific way. Let's have a look. The Bible goes on to say. Oh, have I not given the verse? Guys, I ain't going to have to pull this verse up on the screen. I'm going to have to open my Bible to it the good old fashioned way. Give me a moment. So if I go to Ephesians. This is why you always have to have a Bible handy, even when you're putting verses on the screen for a live chat. Because you never know when technology or planning is going to fail you completely. And the King James reads. When he had said that he had ascended up high, he led captivity captive. And he gave gifts unto men. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 9. Now he that ascended, what is he? But he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth. And he descended is the same also that ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. Now, what I love about this is brilliant. And so the emphasis of this passage that he ascended, that he that he ascended and took captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. It makes the emphasis immediately afterwards that the point is that he could not rise up unless he first went down into the lower parts of the world. If Jesus had not come down from heaven, there was no way that he would be able to ascend back up to heaven. But Jesus came down for a purpose. And what was Jesus's purpose? Was to overthrow the powers of darkness so he could make take his victory over sin and over death so that he could take victory over the spirits of this world for the one purpose and that purpose is so that he could set us free and so that he could imprison once and for all the condemnation and the lies of the enemy and he could give us a new hope. Jesus had to descend into the lower parts. He had to come down into the places of darkness that were at work in this world so that he could be green to begin us the breakthrough that we needed. And ultimately, then he would resurrect and ascend into the most high place, into the heavenly of heavenlies. Why? And he blesses us with gifts and he pours out his spirit. He first comes as a man and shows us that it's possible for us men to overcome. And then he ascends up high and then he gives the spirit of his son, Jesus. He gives us the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit empowers us to live this radical, transformative, victorious life in Jesus. And so he gives us his gifts, these gifts unto men. Right. I'm going on a bit now and I really want to keep talking about some of the uncommon talking points about Jesus' death, his burial and resurrection. If you can't tell already, I'm a geek. And this is, these are the things that get me so excited and get me so worked up. And I just want to talk about some of the strange things that I don't ever really talk to other believers about. And oftentimes I spend my time teaching and helping other believers to understand the basics. So I never go into some of these little details very often. So I'm sharing it with you, the community online. Here we go. So if we go to the book of Jude, one of the things that we see it, that Jude is writing about is he starts to speak about Enoch, one of the seven righteous men 
the first seven men that were righteous in the Bible. And now it says, now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied also about these men also saying. So he's prophesying about the evil men that would be in the last days. Behold, the Lord comes with 10,000 of his saints to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them of their ungodly deeds, which they have committed in, un in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which the ungodly sinners have spoken against him. The point that I've got with this verse is that Enoch comes into this world and he preaches this message of the coming end time judgment. He preaches about how Jesus is going to return and he's going to come with his saints and they're going to come riding down in glory again with him. And he's telling people that they've got to repent and he's repeating people, they're telling people about the coming judgment that's to come. And the point of me mentioning this is because Jesus' death and his resurrection is to try and save us from this judgment. Now, a lot of the time we don't like to talk about judgment, but I am going to touch on this a little because it's hard to separate the resurrection of Jesus from judgment. There are two ways that you can escape judgment or that you can approach judgment, I should say. The first way is you can approach judgment as a good believer, putting your confidence and your trust in Jesus, saying, God, I believe that you died and you resurrected. I'm turning away from my old ways and I'm turning to your ways. And we put our confidence and our complete trust in Jesus. This is the Christian way of dealing with judgment. But there is another way. We can be hard and stubborn and stick to our own guns. And we can face the judgment for our own actions. And each person can be repaid according to their works. As Christ comes to judge the world with his saints who he's given authority to judge beside him. He comes into this world. You see, there are two options in life. This is constant through the scriptures. This isn't Luke speaking now. This is what the Bible teaches. Let me give you a few examples of places where there are two options of judgment. There is a good option and the resurrection of hope. And there is a resurrection of damnation spoken of throughout the scriptures. So let's have a look at Jesus's own words about the resurrection when it comes to Martha and Martha and Lazarus. And it says, in John 11, Martha is Lazarus's brother. Lazarus has just died. And so let's see what the conversation goes. Now, in the pink on my screen are the words of Martha, but in the red are the words of Jesus in the Gospel of John. Now, Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if he had been here with my brother, he would not have died. And Jesus said unto her, your brother will rise again. And Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again at the resurrection in the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection, the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, shall live. And whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Here we see this passage. Martha fully understands. That in the last day, there is going to be a resurrection and those that have passed away are going to be brought back to life. But she also seems to understand something far more important than the resurrection of the last days. She knows who Jesus is. She says that you are the Christ. Now, I skip that verse for time. But then Jesus turns to her and says, it's not enough to believe in the resurrection in the last day. He says right here, I am Martha. Sorry, I am Martha. I am the resurrection. Jesus says, I am the resurrection. Sorry, I got distracted by one of the comments. I, it's all I saw was Martha sounds like Michael Jackson laughing out loud. And it really threw me there for a moment. And so here's Jesus. I am the resurrection. Don't wait until the very end of time for the last day and for the day of judgment to believe in the resurrection of God. Jesus says, no, 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 no. If you believe in me, I am the resurrection and you shall have life and you shall not die. And he's making this point to Martha that he is God's ultimate resurrection. And the last day resurrection is not the hope, but the hope that we need as believers is right here in the person of Jesus. The irony is that in just under three years of him saying this, 
I'm not sure if it was three years or one year later. I don't know the exact time scale. Jesus would be dead. But it's okay because Jesus always declared that he is the resurrection. I bet you when Martha turned up at that tomb and found that Jesus had resurrected, she was astounded. She probably thought that the resurrection was just about raising her brother Lazarus to life, to finish his years and to die at a ripe old age. But now the resurrection of Jesus has come, the death, the burial and the resurrection of Jesus has come. And now the resurrection means something new to her. Now she's going to see that the resurrection is something, a hope that can take any person far beyond the average years, far beyond 70 or 80 years of life. God can raise you back to eternal life. And you know what? The solution was always Jesus. He's always been the key to this rebuilding of society and the restructuring of the world. Let's keep going a little bit more in this. Now, I've showed you that verse and we've heard a little, little, little bit of Martha's voice. Let's go now into the book of John again. And we're going to read again some of the words of Jesus. Now, this is all Jesus speaking. And Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you. It should say an hour is coming. The V would have been a little note in one of the Bibles anyway. An hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. Let's just stop there. I want to lay emphasis big time in this point. Who will hear the voice of the Son of God? The dead. And the dead that hear will be the ones that live. Oh, let's just stop there. If you don't hear God, you're not going to live. Hearing the voice of God, hearing God's call, hearing God move your heart, hearing God move your spirit, hearing God direct you and lead you in life is essential. If you're not part of God's sheep, if you're not part of God's flock, then it's high time that you got your ears open and said, Jesus, I believe in you. Guide me and lead me. How do you want me to live? Go find a preacher. Go find a man. Go find a woman that prays. Go find somebody to tell you about Jesus and the direction that he wants to take you in your life. Let them guide you to a place where you will hear God for yourself because it's those that hear God that will live. And if you're not hearing him now, how much harder is it going to be to hear him when you're dead in your grave? You've got to learn to hear the voice of God right now because a day is coming that if you learn to hear his voice, when he calls out, even if you're lying in the grave, you're going to hear and life is going to spring back up in you. You've got to do your learning to hear God right here and right now. Because there are so many dead people that never heard God in this life that I don't expect they're going to learn to hear God in the grave. First point. Let's keep moving in that same passage. Then Jesus goes on to say in verse 28, do not marvel at this. For an hour is coming when all who are in tombs will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life. This is why I say that we've got to learn to hear Jesus. But then listen to the other side of it. And those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. Oh, I hope you can hear this. If you don't learn to hear God in this life and get to know him as a friend, you won't go to the resurrection of life. But the day is coming that the power of the voice of God will be so loud that even those that don't want to hear the voice of Jesus are going to be woken up from their slavery, from their slumber, from their sin, from their deathbed, from the grave, from their ashes. Every person is going to be waken. You know why? Because in the book of Revelation, the Bible speaks about the power of God's voice. It's the sound of many mighty rushing waters. The voice of God will be so powerful and profound that nobody can escape it. Woo! Now, I'm a deep sleeper, but I don't sleep as heavy as those that are dead. But I'm telling you, God's voice is going to awaken people. It's better that you learn to hear it now and that you be on the side of resurrection to eternal life. You see, people have this idea that God sends people to hell. That's not the case whatsoever. God sends people to wherever they choose to go. 
If you choose to listen and to follow God and to be a friend of God, then guess what? You can spend some time in the place of friendship with God. But if you don't and you choose to reject God and you choose to close your ears to God, then the day is coming that he will wake you up and he will answer your request and he will send you out of his presence. The problem that many of us have today is that we don't realize as bad as this world is, and I've heard it described as hell on earth. And let me be honest with you. When people say that this is hell on earth, I don't argue with them because I know people that have experienced some things that I feel should only take place in hell. And they've been wrong and they've been hurt and they've been abused and they've been tr and tragic things have happened to them. Things that came straight from the pits of hell when we believed the lie of the enemy and hell began to manifest itself here on earth. As people began to suffer and lament and to die and to feel guilt and shame and separation from God. These were things that belonged in hell from the beginning. The, the devil's voice and our believing of the devil began to manifest and to bring to life here in the world. But the true and the reverse is also true. And that Jesus spoke the words of heaven. And as he began to speak and as people believe him and as we trust him and as faith and love are established, guess what? The life of heaven and the kingdom of God begins to be established right here on earth. Starting right here with the hearer of the, those that hear the voice of God and that follow and that do what he says. God begins to build himself right from within a person. And once he's got a hold of one heart, then he can fix a relationship. Once he can fix a relationship, he can fix a marriage. And once he fixes the marriage, he'll change a family. And from a family, he can change a community all the way up to changing the structure of government and how we rule and guide and lead and to look after and how we care for one another and to loving our neighbors and changing the world. He can turn the world upside down, but he has to start with hearing his voice. Now, I've completely lost exactly where I was going from. So let me go back to the scriptures to see exactly where I was coming from. Okay, so the resurrection. That was it, wasn't it? It was this verse. So those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. So it's important. I ain't gonna, I'm not going to slide away from this. I know that this is an Easter message, but like I said, this is the Easter message that I probably wouldn't feel comfortable preaching from the pulpit. Not because there's anything wrong with it, but because on a Sunday morning, on an Easter, I'm preaching faith and hope to the people that are lost, that are coming in, because it's their first ever Easter service. And you want them to hear the gospel and the hope, and you want them to know the basics. But equally, I'm taking the chance now to tell you that there is a resurrection of damnation. There is a resurrection. Of, uh, uh, there is not a resurrection that we want to be a part of. But Daniel, Daniel sees it too. And many of them that slept in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting content, contempt. That doesn't sound like a place that believers really want to go. Right. Now, I've said all that because it's important. It's important that you understand this. When Jesus died as a human being, his death and burial and resurrection was not just for those who were saved. His death, burial and resurrection made him the savior, the savior of the world and of all mankind. Guess what he's going to do? Jesus one day is going to resurrect everybody. He's going to resurrect the righteous first, but he's also going to resurrect the unrighteous. And he's going to clean up the earth and remake the earth. And then those that still choose to live a life of disobedience will be sentenced to the lake that burns with fire so that they don't pollute the new heaven and the new earth that he's created. God's cleaning up his house, but he's going to start by judging the people and he's going to wash the people that are going to remain in his house so they don't get it dirty. And those that don't want to be a part of his house, he's going to say, that's fine. I'm going to let you go away from my presence where you want to go. The problem that we face is that you and I have never lived in a world where God doesn't pour out his blessing upon both the good and the bad, the righteous and the unrighteous. There's a saying in the scripture. There's a saying that we often hear. It rains on both the good and the bad. It rains on the just and the unjust. Many people, when they say that this world is hell, 
don't realize that they still experience some of the glimmers of love and of hope and of mercy and of pleasure and of joy and of faith and of faithfulness and of trust and of so much good. They don't realize that they're still experiencing the goodness of God. They are experiencing bits of things that have jumped out of hell, let's be honest, but they don't recognize that the goodness of God is also at work right here in the land of the living. But a day is coming that people are going to unwittingly and unknowingly, because of the bad in the world, reject God, because they've been sold a lie, not realizing that there are certain goods in this world that will disappear as they're put out of God's presence. This is why we go on this rescue mission, to teach people better so that they can learn and understand that God is good and he has the best intention for all believers and for all people in this world. But we've got to tell them the whole message, lest they believe the lie of the enemy, that God is the maker of evil and God is the reason that all these bad things have happened to them. Just the opposite. They came from hell. They came from the mouth of the enemy and the evils of men have propagated. Men have become evil, believing Satan's lies and done great evils to one another. We've corrupted the world. So now we have famines. He's caused us to be in conflict and not live in peace with one another. And so now the rewards. This is all straight from the enemy's playbook. Right. Let's get to a, a bit more of this. It's time's ticking. I'm already 46 minutes into this video. And so I think now is a good time to get to 1 Corinthians. Let's get to the hope of the good resurrection. And Paul the Apostle says this, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised, incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Oh, hallelujah. I love this verse. Now, a lot of believers will say this is a rapture verse. I'm not going to argue with that. But I know not everyone has the same end time belief. So, and so I want to just say something about this. We are going to be changed. Listen, we might be made of the dust of the ground and of this earth. Everything falls apart that came from this earth. Everything that comes into this earth in the flesh will have corruption, will age, will die, will wither, will fade away. But guess what? God's going to change us in the twinkling. He's going to raise us again. And we're going to put off the corruptible nature of the flesh, of the dust that we're made of. And we're going to be putting on a new body, an incorruptible body. You don't have to always work hard in the gym to get a heavenly body. The Bible says that God is going to raise us up and he's going to make this corruptible flesh into something incorruptible. I don't have to work on the vanity and the wrinkles and trying to stop myself from aging because I know a day is coming that God is going to take the years off me and he's going to make me pristine and make me the model specimen that he always purposed for my life to be. No longer will you have to fight and to labor to not sin. But a day is coming where the desires of the flesh to sin will not be known to us. They'll be so foreign to us and we'll be made to be like him. That's it. Like Jesus. Who's resurrected and received a new and a glorious body. Hallelujah. So this is the hope. It's called the rapture. It's where believers are resurrected. Now notice that in the twinkle of an eye, we'll be raised. Hallelujah. And it's all believers that will be raised. The dead in Christ are raised first. And then those of us that are alive will also be caught up into the clouds to meet with him in the clouds. Hallelujah. And we will live a glorious new life together with Jesus. But then if we go into the book of Revelation, I believe it speaks about the same thing. I believe, if you didn't know, this is my own personal end time beliefs. I believe that the rapture is a part of the resurrection. It's the resurrection of the just. It is the first resurrection spoken of in scripture. And the fact that I'm speaking about a first resurrection should make you realize that I also believe that there is going to be a second resurrection. I wonder what that could be after the things that we've just discussed. Let's see what the book of Revelation says. And I saw thrones and they sat on them and judgment was committed to them then i saw the souls who were beheaded for their witness to jesus 
and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and who had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they had lived and, re- and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So here's John on the Isle of Patmos, and God's given him a vision, and he's seeing the future, and he sees people who have died, they have been beheaded for believing and trusting in Jesus and the words of God. And as a result of it, they refused to worship anyone but God. They refused to worship the beast. They refused to worship a deceiver. And they have a mark on their forehead or to take the mark on their right hand or on their forehead. And guess what happens? They have been raised to life again and they live and reign with Christ for a thousand years. It is a resurrection verse. These are believers that have been raised to life and now they've experienced 1,000 years living together with Christ. Hallelujah. This is a rapture verse. These people have been raptured and brought back to life, back from the grave, back from death, back from their beheading. And now they're alive and they're experiencing what it is to rule and to reign with Christ. Oh, hallelujah. There's a faithful saying that Paul speaks about in some of the scriptures that he writes to Timothy. This is the faithful saying. Those that live and those that die for Christ shall live with him. Those that suffer him shall also reign with him. Um, I'm butchering that verse. But you know the passage I'm on about. There's a faithful saying where Paul is basically teaching Timothy, I believe it was, that you know what? We're going to go through things, but it's okay because we're considered worthy to be a partaker of his life with him in his suffering, but also in his glory. You suffer with him, you'll be glorified with him. If you serve him, then guess what? You're going to reign with him. And Paul is making this point. And here we read in the book of Revelation about this resurrection, or what I would call it, the rapture, the first resurrection. Then it goes on to say, but the rest of the dead did not live again until a thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. And so the first resurrection, those that would reign again with Christ would live. But the rest of the dead did not live during that first thousand years. Blessed and holy is he who was part of the first resurrection. Over such, death has no power but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Oh, it's where it gets good. So the first resurrection is what I believe is the rapture where believers are resurrected to be with Christ and that we will rule and reign together with Christ for a thousand years. Just notice the timing of this. Notice how good it is. Also notice that it's only believers in Jesus that are partakers in the first resurrection. This is what we think about oftentimes when we look at the resurrection of Jesus on Easter Sunday. We look at the hope for those that believe because nobody wants to ever talk about the emptiness of the second resurrection that we're going to come to in a moment. Let's have a read to the next verse and it says, Now when a thousand years had expired, Satan will be released from prison And he will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth. Before anyone goes flat earth on me, four corners of the earth simply speaks about north, south, east and west. It speaks about every direction on the earth. The angels will go out. Satan will go out. His demons will go out to the four corners of the earth to deceive. And it says in verse 8, their devil who deceived them was was cast into the lake of fire where the beast and the false prophet are and they will be tormented day and night forever. Now this is the part that we don't like to think about. We now read about the judgment of the enemy, the judgment of the devil. Guess what? Those that believe the devil's lies will face the devil's judgment. This is why those that believe in Jesus's words will also receive and follow Jesus's judgment. What you believe and how you choose to orientate yourself, what you choose to follow is what you will partake of. And I want to make a point about this. A lot of people have loads of different theology about the demonic and the spiritual realm. But as far as I can see in scripture, 
those that follow rebellious spirits and re rebellious teachers are going to find that their judgment is the judgment of rebellion and they're going to be judged as a rebel. But those that follow the God of life, their judgment will be one of those who follow the one who brings life into the world, Jesus. Oftentimes in the Bible, we see a parallel between judgments, between the angelic and man. For example, Adam and Eve, when they sinned, God didn't sentence them to hell, but God also didn't sentence Satan straight to hell there and then. He didn't say, go both for you, Adam, Eve, Satan, go into the lake that burns with fire. No, he did not. The reason being is if God had sentenced Satan right there to the lake that burns with fire, it would have only been fair that he also sentenced mankind straight to the lake that burns with fire. The reason that the world has so much evil going on right now is God's given us time to separate ourselves from the evil. So when the day comes where God judges the evil, that we not be mixed up and caught up in partaking in it. The reason that Jesus came into this world is to give us the power to break the bondage of evil and of sin and of the demonic and of the oppression and the guilt and the weight and the heaviness that this world puts on us so that we could be bound together with him rather than being caught up in the devil's lies and strategies throughout scripture. When mankind sins so and is judged, so are the evil spirits that are present in the sins of mankind. That doesn't mean that the, the devil's made man sin, but the devil that inspires certain sin, the demons that inspire certain sins, they're judged at the same moment that people are. That's why when Sodom and Gomorrah comes crashing down, it's like how when the angels were cast down from their first estate, when there's a parallelism going on in the scriptures with between the judgment of man and the judgment of the enemy and the judgment of the demons and the spirits. Now, let's go on a little bit about this, because the cross is a judgment. At the cross, man finds itself being set free, but the devil finds himself being, <laughs> being defeated. It's, it's a powerful thing. There's, a, a, there's this blessing, there's this role reversal. At the cross, we see the separation between the judgment of mankind and the judgment of devil and the devil being really broken apart. The two are shifted apart. The Bible says that the rocks were broken. Why? Because the power of what was going on at the cross. For the first time in history, we have a clear in moment that we see mankind able, because of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, to break away from the power of sin. Oh, that means something's great. It means that addictions could be broken by the power of the blood, by the power of the Holy Spirit and the resurrection of a dead man. It means that the old life could be put to death because we can bury it together with Jesus. Why? So that we could rise up again in the new life. The Bible says that, that we would learn to crucify ourselves. Why? Because we follow the one who has been crucified. All of a sudden, the cross gave us three different means, his death, his burial. And his resurrection, these three means to separate ourselves from the old life and to join ourselves to a new and a more glorious way. We sometimes we don't see it. There's so much going on at the cross of Jesus. But like I say, this is a theology lesson that isn't really the one that I teach on a Sunday morning. I'm just preaching faith on a Sunday morning to a church that don't hear about Jesus, to a world that come in on an Easter and don't hear about Jesus. I want to give you a different flavor of this because as mature believers, it's our responsibility to dig into these words and to bring ourselves these messages and to find ourselves these hopes that would empower us to live further and further for God. It's so important that we dig and that we get these things. And so we see the death, burial and resurrection of Jesus are powerful events that separate good and bad, <laughs> light and darkness. It's a turning point. It's the place where the curse becomes the blessing. We have got to take it with all that we can. Now, let's continue. Have I showed you this verse? Yes, we have. Let's try again. How about this verse? Yes, we have. All right, now I think I'm on to my final verse. 
And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before the Lord, and the books were opened. And the books were opened. Another book was opened, which was the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by which were, um, by, by the things which were written in the books. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. And death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were all judged, each according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now, what I love so much about this is now it begins to tell us about how everyone is going to have to stand before the white throne of God, the judgment of God, death and Hades, the sea, everyone, everywhere, no matter where you died, there's no hiding from this. If you were in the ashes, guess what? God will raise you from the ashes to stand before his throne on judgment day. This is the beauty of the God who we serve. He does nothing more than bless and to bring judgment and to make us answer for what we have chosen in life. So the motto of the story is, be careful what you choose, choose that which is good and turn to Jesus. Now, there are some things that this Easter, that this Passover time that I am not going to be able to delve into today. But I want to throw some sprinklers out there for those that want to be blessed and that want to do some reading to bless themselves. Maybe you thought this because I wasn't going to go over the basics. Maybe you wanted to ask some questions like I have in the past about how long was Jesus dead? There was a conversation that I was having with someone on social media. Now, let me just say this. that I was raised being taught that Jesus died on the Friday, Saturday, rose on the Sunday, three days. As time went by, I came under the influence and the teaching and the persuasive arguments about both a Wednesday and a Thursday crucifixion of Jesus. But I want to tell you this, that I now have come reverted back to my belief, my original belief that Jesus died on the Friday. And I want to explain a little bit about why I don't believe that it's necessary that Jesus has to be dead for 72 hours. When the Bible speaks about three days and three nights, in the same way that the Bible also says for 40 days and for 40 nights. It's an idiom. It's a figure of speech used to represent a period of time. It doesn't mean 24 hours. The Jewish people never used a 24 hour clock in the way that we do in our Greco Roman time frame that we have now. Their day didn't start at 12 midnight and then go all the way through to 12 the next midnight. That's not how they counted their time. In fact, when you read the Gospels, there are two different ways that time is being counted, depending on which Gospel you're reading. In the Gospel of Matthew, Mark and Luke, I believe that time is laid out in Galilean time because these Galileans continue to talk about time the way that they know it. And the Galileans followed the teaching of the the Pharisees. And the Pharisees taught that the day begins at sunrise. And it ends at sunset. So let me say that the day begins at sunrise. And so around 6 a.m. was the beginning of a new time, a new day for the Jewish people that lived and followed the Pharisees teachings. Now, here's where it gets a little bit more interesting. If you go into Judea, you have a different group of people. It's run by the temple, which was priests, which were oftentimes Sadducees. Now, the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection. They were influenced a lot more by the Greeks and by the Romans. And as a result of it, they didn't count their time anymore by sunrise. They started each of their days at sunset. And now let me throw you the magic eight ball. I said this was about how many days Jesus was dead for. I want to point your attention to something. Jesus ate the Last Supper meal at the time of the Passover in Galilee with his disciples. At the correct time for the Galileans, Jesus ate the Passover. That's right. In Galilean time, at the right time the Pharisees would have been eating, Jesus was eating the Passover meal just after the time the Passover should have been killed according to the Pharisees and the Galilean time. However, 
because Galilean time would have been about 12 hours in front of the beginning of the day under the Judean and under the priestly line, guess how what happened? 12 hours later after the Last Supper, Jesus has gone to Gethsemane and he's been praying and now he's been taken for very quick and expedient trial. And 12 hours later, he's dying on the cross at the exact time that the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the priesthood and the high priest was killing the Passover lamb. Jesus was able to fulfill both in one go. It's amazing. Absolutely amazing. Jesus was both there to eat and to make a marriage proposal to his disciples at the Last Supper, at the time of the Passover lamb, according to the Pharisees. But then, according to the priest, he was being killed at the time of the Passover lamb. We see both playing out at the same, in the same 24 hour window, but being counted 12 hours apart because there were two different times going on at the same time. And when you factor that into account, all of a sudden you don't need to even take into account the fact that there were multiple Sabbaths, the Saturday Sabbath and the High Sabbath as a result of the timing of everything that was going on in that Holy Week. Now, for those that want to dig into those kind of things, I'm throwing it at you. So the idiom, three days and three nights, is just a figure of speech used to count a period of time, which is why we also find a contradictory term, if you take three days and three nights to be true, on the third day, not after the third day was complete, on the third day. These terms would contradict one another if it's not just a figure of speech. On the third day is very different to three days and three nights because it doesn't necessarily include the final part of the third day. So I've come to the point now where I simply believe that Jesus died on Friday. He ate the Passover with his disciples on the Thursday. And I believe that this helps to fit in with all the difficulties and the intricacies that are there in the Gospels. But please, as always, everything that I've said here, I've shown you verses apart from the ending. Don't take my word for any of it. I encourage you to dig into the Bible for yourself so that everybody can make themselves personally in their own conscience feel comfortable with the things that I'm teaching or saying or speaking or that the Holy Spirit might be speaking to you, because it's not for me to tell you what to believe. I simply preach and teach the message of God, and he will quicken what he wants you to hear, what you're ready to hear. It's the Lord that speaks the, and has the final saying on all matters of faith and of our practice as we worship and as we live for God. Now, are there any other interesting Easter and Passover time ideas that you guys have questions or thoughts or that you wanted to talk about. If you do have any questions or any comments or any thoughts, put them in the live chat. I'm going to have a skim through and a read of them in a moment. But I just want to say this while I'm going through all this. Um, yeah, the reason that Jesus had to ascend and go down into the, the lower parts of the earth. What was Jesus doing when he died? Proclaiming captivity and setting the captives free. You've heard that verse used before. What was he doing? Was he preaching to dead saints? No, he was declaring his victory over death to everyone in the grave because a day was coming that his voice and remembrance of what he's done and the grave itself would be emptied because the message of victory that he spoke when he went to the grave and died would be the same message that he would, would be the same voice <coughs> that would one day raise everyone back to eternal life. <coughs> the Bible says that Jesus is a savior for all, especially to those that believe. And it's a verse that I never understood, but now I get it. Jesus will save us all <coughs> in one sense from death. He will save us all from seeing the corruption of this world and living in a broken world because everybody will be raised back to life and he will remake the world. But unfortunately, some people will be put out of his presence and go to another place. They won't see the new heaven and earth. They won't see the world fall into corruption again. 
what the Bible says will have their part in the lake that burns with fire. And it's my prayer that nobody has to go there. The Bible says that Jesus alone is the way to heaven. It's a very uncommon, it's a very unpopular, sorry, teaching. And I want to explain why. Because Jesus makes an exclusive statement. He doesn't say that all religions are all faiths or that being a good person is enough. He actually says that, no, even if you're a good person, that's not enough. He makes it very exclusive and he says that he alone is the way to everlasting and eternal life. And so let's have a look if there's any questions. If not, I'm just going to have a read. Amen. The moment you hear those words, they apply to you. Awesome share, Brother Luke. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks be to the spirit of our Father and you. May God's grace and mercy and peace be with you. At Victory, go ahead. No one's stopping you. I like how Jesus directs his messages to the past, future and the present. He just speaks directly to whoever hears the message. The world don't like Jesus. You know what? doesn't have to like Jesus. But you know what? They need to believe in him and they need to turn to him. One of the things that's difficult about Jesus is the first thing that Jesus ever did was tell me how bad I was. And I felt woefully unworthy. But being the kind of person that I am, when I feel pretty bad about myself and someone throws me a lifeline, I take it. A lot of the world oftentimes are very proud and reject Jesus because they're so accustomed to doing things their own way. Truthfully, I've been like that. I've been swimming and almost drowned as a child and had to have a tape measure thrown in at me. And guess what? I only took the tape measure when I truly came to the point. It's like a tape measure with a rope kind of thing that used to pull me out. I only reached for it, if I'm honest, at the point where I knew that I definitely couldn't do it on my own. And there are so many people in the world that are still living thinking that they can do this on their own. And so they're not ready to be saved. In fact, if anyone's ever done any life, um, lifeguard training, you will know that it is dangerous for you to get in the water and to try and save the life of someone who is not ready to be saved because they will kick, they will punch, they will pull you under the water. It's dangerous. You know what? Who are the easy people to save? Those that are barely fight alive at all. Those that have become unconscious because you can just pull them up and pull them out of the water and you can just swim and just hold on to them like a float. But while we're alive, we kick and we scream and we're the hardest people to pull out of the sea and to pull out of the waters of life that we're drowning in. Thankfully, we serve a true saviour, a good shepherd and a lifeguard that is here for us on a rescue mission. His name is Jesus. If you don't know the gospel and you've never heard it, the Bible says that God so loved this world that he came into this world through his only child, Jesus. He was one of a kind. Jesus is the very impression, the very mind, the very perfection of God being manifest in this world in the form of a man. Why? So that guilty men like you and I could turn to a human being that we could touch. It's so hard sometimes for us to get to know God personally because we just want to touch him and throw our arms around him. So what does God do? God becomes a man so that one man throughout all history could demonstrate his love and could show us how to treat one another, how to help one another and how to lay down our life, how to live the perfect life, how to turn away from sin. It was Jesus. And so we have this picture now of Jesus coming to this, to this world, being completely innocent of our wrongs. And he says, I will pay the price for your sins. And here's Jesus, this Messiah figure, this perfect man who goes to the cross and he dies so that he could pay for the wrongs that I'm guilty of. His blood was shed and he's buried and goes to the grave. I'm forgiven for the wrongs that I've done because I trusted in Jesus. And here's where it gets really so messy. Then we end up with this messy situation. And it's this. We, though we've been forgiven, we're not going to live any differently except there is someone, there is the innocent, perfect man that would walk alongside us and show us how to live this perfect life. We can't do it on our own. We need him. 
But the Bible says that he died for our sins. But we need him to live this renewed life. His disciples needed him by their side to do the miracles, to walk on water, to overcome the obstacles in this life. We need the superhero. And so what has God done? God raises Jesus back to life and pours out his spirit upon us so that we're never alone in this world, so that we have the spirit of God here at work, allowing us and guiding us and showing us the way to go. Now, you can't follow the spirit of God except you repent. You can't find forgiveness of the mistakes that you've made until you turn away from them and you begin to turn and look up at Jesus. You can't trust God whilst you're still choosing to hold on to and and enjoy the the pleasures and the passions of your sin. But as we turn to God, we have to let go of our sin. We have to let go of what's over there. And we turn and we look up to Jesus and we focus on him and we turn from our sin and we confess our wrongs and he's faithful and just to forgive us. And then we go after him. And then the Bible says that he pours out his spirit upon us and he gives us the life of his son to lead us and to guide us and to drive us and to show us the right way to turn. The hope that we have is Jesus. And if we follow him, guess what? The Bible says that we will be resurrected like he is. This is the gospel. If you've never heard it, oh, somebody, if you've not heard it, drop me a message, drop me an email, find me. Find a church, find someone that will teach you about it because I tell you, it is Jesus in us that gives us hope in this world. We have overcome the world. We who believe have overcome this world. Why? Because Jesus lives in us and he empowers us to live a different way. But you can't get Jesus in you unless you repent, unless you find the forgiveness and the blood of Jesus to wash you away. You've got to clean the vessel first before you can fill it. And so we've got to first believe in the, what Jesus has done at the cross. I'm telling you this. God was ready to slap a massive fine on you that you could not pay. And Jesus stepped forward and said, I will pay the price to turn judgment away from you. You ever seen those people that go to court and they're in court for financial problems? They've got a debt that's too big for them to pay. And then ultimately, somebody else says, I will pay their debt. And he slaps down the money to pay the price on behalf of those that couldn't. And as a result of him paying the price, they no longer have to fear being sent to jail because they're defaulted and they could not pay their debts. This is what Jesus has done for us. He's paid the price that we could not pay for ourselves. And that price cost him everything. It wasn't just financial. It was the price of sin. And the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. The price that Jesus had to pay to turn away judgment from us was death. But death couldn't hold him because he had no sin of his own, because he was the son of God, because he was righteous. Death can only hold those that have done wrong. And where there was a man that would die that does no wrong, let me tell you this, this is why the rocks had to be torn. This is why the graves had to be opened. This is why hell had met his match and had been overcome because you can't hold a good person down because Jesus broke the grave. Sin could not hold him because he had, death could not hold him because he had no sin. And so he rose again to everlasting life. And all those that trust and follow him shall rise again in everlasting life. Now, that's just in the eternal. What about now? He's a healer. He fixes us. He puts us back together. He heals relationship. He restores our faith. He restores our health. He brings vitality to our body. This is Jesus. This is the gospel. He's going to remake the heaven and the earth. That's right. We're trying to save it right now. We will plant trees and we will get our electric cars and we will look for renewable energy. But I tell you this, Jesus is going to remake heaven and earth and put it all back together. This is God's plan. He is the great gardener that's on a rejuvenation project to rebuild the Garden of Eden, to rebuild paradise, to bring heaven and earth together and to collide them so that man and God could live together. You see, I don't want to go to heaven. I want heaven on earth. I want God 
to come down and to recreate the earth and make it a place where God can once again walk in the garden together with mankind. I don't want to go to heaven. I want God to come down here and to clean up the mess that we've made of this earth. God, would you get me out of the place that I am right now? God, would you fix me? Would you fix my relationship? This is the cry of faith. And if that's a cry in you, I want you to make sure that you get yourself to church tomorrow. Find yourself in a church. Find yourself amongst believers that will guide you. If you're that person and you're in the comments, put a post out to me and I'll try and ping a church or someone nearby to you or put you in the right direction to find godly believers that will be able to guide you and help you on this walk with Jesus. Guys, thank you for your time. Um, wow, there's been a lot of chats since we've been gone. Um, let's have a quick skim through. I'm guilty of that as well in the past, but thank God, thank the Lord God for saving me. Hallelujah. Not only my child, but my only begotten son. The angels too are also sons of God. Hallelujah. Amen. Powerful. You must also repent. Yes, definitely. Faith eternally. We get and it's awesome. Praise the Lord. So if you are new to my channel, please do take the chance to like, comment and subscribe to my channel, Jesus Doctrine. Um, I'll try and keep you up to date with all my new comment. And I'm sorry for all the notifications today that have been annoyingly pinging that the videos didn't work. I'm live streaming from my phone, which always gives me a few technical difficulties. But I want to thank you again for joining me for this live stream, guys. God bless you and good night.